Hello everyone, it's Avon and today I'm back with another video. So for today's video I want to once again delve into the rich world of philosophy and to do that I looked into my dad's library and I found this amazing book he got when he was on a trip to the US. So it's Think Little by Wendell Berry. Now this book was written in 1972 and I've always been wanting to talk about this book, but I never had the time to actually read it because I'm you know, actually a bit of a procrastinator. But today I wanted to sum up the main part of this book. Now this book, or more specifically this edition, was published in 1972. And this book is a collection of two of Reynolds Berry's essays. First of all, we have the actual Think Little, which is the first 31 pages, and the rest is A Native Hill, which I think I'll cover next week. I just wanted to talk about Think Little today so that you could get a good idea of what this book is actually about. And today I'm going to be quoting the book um, a lot, so be prepared for that. I'm going to go into detail about what this book actually discusses and how I can relate to it. And in the end, I'll talk about what I actually learned from this. Now, rough word of let's begin. So basically, the first thing that Wendell Berry says in this essay of his is that first we had a civil rights movement in the US, then we had a war, and after that we currently have an environmental crisis. Now, after th this may seem a bit random at first, but after that he makes us understand how all three of these are connected. And it's perfectly summed up if I read this passage from the book, it's the mentality that exploits and destroys the natural environment is the same that abuses racial and economic minorities and is the same ideology that imposes on young men the tri tyranny of the military draft that makes war against peasants and women and children with the indifference of technology and the mentality that destroys the watershed and then panics at the threat of the flood. And he explains that this mentality is the root of all modern problems in a way because because of this mentality life just keeps getting worse and after this he explains that the environmental crisis is not like the other two crises because of the civil war and the civil war and the civil rights movement both of them they all had a lot of bloodshed in them and they had political formations in them but this is nothing like that because it's even though it may be related in a way, but still, you can't say that because it's closer to home and it's closer to the people because its impact falls on everything. The air we breathe gets polluted and this wasn't a fact at the time or this wasn't actually known to science at the time when this book was published, which was 1972, but a few people are, are you know, caught up with the lay science news to know that children are starting to be born with microplastics in them, which just shows how much of an impact plastic has had on our world. And that's just baffling. And because of this, he, this passage, which I'm also going to read right now, is our next part of this sort of explanation of this book. So it's, our economy's first principle is waste. We are causing the crisis. Now, I can actually give a lot of examples of how this is like true because and how it's factually correct because you see the waste that's generated by all our actions is a sort of backbone for our actions themselves because you see when you have anything done you're going to produce waste from it and there's not any completely renewable thing at the moment and it's because of this that Vanderbilt states that waste is what generates the base of our economy and now what this actually implies is that if you have any waste generated on that waste you can run an entire economy and i'll give an example of this for example let's say you're in a restaurant okay and you see another group of people now they can order a bunch of things and not even eat any of it and they can just leave it there now they can't just the restaurant people they can't just serve it to someone else because of sanitation issues and hygiene problems and you know, that's perfectly understandable but it's this consumerism that causes all this waste to be generated and it's that waste that can later be transported and can be sold and this waste if you know if it's actually renewed and recycled 
it can actually be used to make new products i mean if it's food then this doesn't really apply that way but you know still if it's food you can make fertilizer out of it but that really requires some effort to it and a lot of people aren't really willing to do that and that just proves how waste just generates the backbone of the economy because the amount of money and the amount of stuff that's generated just by taking care of the and managing that waste is what's causing the backbone of this economy of ours as and the states and the more waste we create the larger the economy grows and that more results in more consumerism which is a big win for major companies but is going to gradually worsen our lives i can say and this is what when this is why Randall Very says everyone of us has a public responsibility and we can't just let that go. If you let that go, then whatever we do or whatever we love, it's going to slip and it's going to become degenerated. And uh, after this he states that if you want to actually rally the government now, this means that if you're actually looking to tell the government and you're trying to reason with the government about not doing these kinds of things what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to tell them in a way that they will understand and this doesn't mean you're going to protest because when the very again says here a crowd whose discontent is no higher than the level of slogans will only be a crowd but a crowd that understands the reason for the discontentment and knows the remedies of it is a force to be reckoned with and after this one where he says that he'd rather go with two men to the to the government he'd go with two men who know the problem rather than two thousand people who are just there and with this he just shows that how we have a public responsibility and we have to have knowledge of the situation if we don't have that knowledge then we're not going to be able to actually have any fruitful results from all our quote-unquote protesting now wendell berry actually sums up our of consumerism in the modern era in his next paragraph of this essay he says that we can't feed or clothe ourselves or entertain ourselves or communicate with each other or be charitable or neighborly or loving or even respect ourselves without resource to a merchant or a corporation or a public service organization or an agency of the government or a style setter or an expert now all the examples he gave in the end just show how our society is changed over times and again this book was written 50 years ago that's amazing 1972 to 2023 add that up it's more than 50 years it's the 51st year this book is literally 51 years old and it's already talking about one of the problems social media now i just like to some of some of the last ones social media just look at social media it's been affecting the way our minds work what you see on social media is your new life goal and your new life expectations and if you can't meet that well you're a piece of garbage and that's what you feed yourself that's what your mind thinks of itself when you use social media and that's why he says a uh, quote-unquote style set of which would have been an appropriate time for the era when this book was published but you know nowadays we just call it an influencer or a tiktoker instagram user so after this, in the next paragraph, we have a quote from the Confucian Great Digest, which says that the chief way for the production of wealth, and the wealth here is real goods, not money, is that the producers should be many and the mere consumers be few. This means that materialistically speaking, a lot of the producers, if a lot of you have a lot of producers and a few consumers, they're going to use their material in a way which allows for great amounts of profit for the producers and the consumers are just going to be like sheep to a shepherd and they're going to be manipulated only for their lives to become attached to these people and they're gonna not they're not gonna be able to be independent like this and that's exactly what Randy Bryce says here where he says a state of helpless dependence on things and services and ideas and motives that we have forgotten how to provide ourselves shows that just as cities developed and how civilization developed, we lost our individuality. You know, this is why the theme of a hive mind is very popular in social media and 
the media in general nowadays because a hive mind means that everyone is connected and there's no individualism there's no self it's a whole it's not i it's us it's we and now Randall Berry also goes to great lengths to explain how actually we're using the Earth's resources in a way that even we can't effectively use. For example, you all know that coal is non-renewable, so if you do use up all the coal in the world, you're not going to be left with much stuff to use. And this is exactly what we Randall Berry writes here. We do not understand the Earth in terms of either of what it offers us or of what it requires of us and i think it is ruled that people inev inevitably destroy what they do not understand most of us are not directly responsible for strip mining or extractive agriculture and other forms of environmental abuse but we are still going to be guilty nevertheless because we're obviously going to be contributing to it after this Wendell Berry discusses the base of our food supply the farmers now these farmers don't get the respect that they do even though all the food that we eat is generated by these farms mostly unless we have small terrace gardens and things but that's a whole different thing as populations grow american farmers or you know, just farmers in general are harder pressed and harder work than ever before and they have to use their lands and they have to cultivate their lands more than ever for better crop yield so that they can satisfy the population but that's not possible without the fertilizers in the market. And the fertilizers in the market nowadays have chemicals and these chemicals reduce the lifespan of the soil and how much time you can use the soil again and again before it becomes barren and you can plant stuff on it. Now, it, it's very disheartening to hear what torture the farmer goes through because he can't compete with industry for labor He's being forced more and more on the use of destructive chemicals, what I just said. As a class, farmers are one of the despised minorities. So far as I can see, farming is considered marginal or incidental to the economy of the country, and farmers, when they are thought of at all, are thought of as hicks and yokels who do not live in the modern scene. And this is what's even more sad is that if a farmer, he has his children, they're not going to take up his profession. Basically, what they're going to do is they're going to go to the cities and modernize themselves and stay away from their country roots and become more urban and this is what is the ultimate downfall of these farmers because once they lose their future generations they're going to be the last of their kind left and after that they're going to eventually die and once they die their land is going to be brought up by the big industries and they're going to do lots of Horrible ways of farming which are going to end up killing everything in the long term because honestly whenever you think about something here's a great rule of thumb always think in the long term there's no short term idea because on a ge geographical time scale humanity has only been alive for 200,000 years which is nothing but a geographical blink of the eye because dinosaurs as we know them were around for more than 150 million years and just in case you don't know one million is ten hundred thousand which is about more than 100 human lifespans thousands of human lifespans is just one million and dinosaurs live 150 million years of that and not to, and not to mention that the earth is 4.6 billion years old which is just something that kills human egos when you think about it because People think that we're the greatest thing that's ever risen, but is that really true? Because who knows what can happen? Maybe even tomorrow the they can have some sort of mass extinction event, and that can just kill everyone. Because these things are unpredictable. You know, maybe a volcanic eruption or stuff. Now, after this, Randall Berry, halfway through the essay, he proposes solutions. Now, first of all, he says that. We need persons and households that do not have to wait upon organizations, but can make necessary changes for themselves. Now, after this, he also talks about what the motto of the country has been for most of the time. It's been, our motto, implied or spoken, has been think big. A better motto, an essential one now, is think little. Hence the title of this essay itself. 
Now, he explains this like this. The lowest leaders of this area are in Washington, D.C., which obviously is the capital of the U.S., thinking big. Somebody perceives a problem, and somebody in the government comes up with a plan or a law. The result mostly has been the persistence of the problem, but the enlargement and enrichment of the government. So that means that the government is the only one who's going to be reaping the benefits here, while the masses are still going to be struggling to some point, and to some extent the problem's never going to be solved. Now, he says that the citizen who is willing to think little and accepting the discipline of that to go ahead his problem is already solving the problem. Instead of just making some stupid law that it doesn't even work, you just have to go ahead with the problem, face it head on, and it's going to be better. If you're considered by the prolifer proliferate <laughs> if you're considered by the proliferation of trash, then by all means start an organization in your community to do something about it. This is again about independently trying to save the environment. Now after this he show, says that the people need to believe in the idea and you need to show them that. So he says, but before and while you organize, pick up some cans and bottles yourself. That way at least you will assure yourself and others that you mean what you say. If you're concerned about air pollution, help push for government controls, but drive your car less and use less fuel in your homes. And it's like this that they again explain how we can just counter all these everyday problems by believing in ourselves and employing ourselves before we believe others and command others to do this for us. Now, after this, he says, if you're fearful about the destruction of the environment, quit being an environmental parasite. But this is honestly one of the things that are the most that I found the saddest of this entire book because it's human nature to reap the benefits of our environment because humans as species have always survived by manipulating the area around them. We are literally designed to just leech off practically everything we see. And it's like this that the last few pages of this book show more actual remedies for this problem, but he, like I said, once I get to the reviewing part of this, I'm going to just explain how disarming even those are. Now, after this, he explains how a person who's growing a garden, if he's growing it organically, is improving a piece of the world. He's producing something to eat, which makes him somewhat independent of the grocery business, like I said, independence. But he's also enlarging for himself the meaning of food and the pleasure of eating, so it's mental fulfillment that's also playing a key role here, but that's not all. He's also going to grow something that's more nutritious. The food that he grows will be fresher, more nutritious, less contaminated by poisons and preservatives and dyes than what he can buy at the store. He's reducing the trash problem as well, which Randall Barry says is the base of the economy. So that trash problem, once you get that out, you're going to be left with an economy that doesn't function on trash, but rather on independence and, like I said, communism. Communism is another interesting key idea here. Now, communism usually ends up very miserably, but wherever it does work, and if it does work, commun communes are actually very good because there's no money, everyone's supposed to be treated equally, and there's equal sharing. It sounds like a good idea, but that's usually a uh, classic sort of utopia to dystopia, and that happens pretty quick most of the time. Now, again, to support this sort of example of how people can survive by just gardening, he quotes Lewis Bromfield, who pointed out that the French survived crisis after crisis because they were a nation of gardeners who, in times who want, turned with great skill to their own small parts of ground and became self-sufficient farmers who grew their own food in order to preserve themselves and prevent themselves from starvation. And in the final pages of this book, he says this. What I'm saying is that if we apply our minds directly and competently to the needs of the earth, then we will have begun to make fundamental and necessary changes in our mind and change our wasteful economy, which marks not just the produce of the earth, but also the ability of the earth to produce. Now, that's all the quotes I'm going to be taking from this book today. 
I think I went a bit overboard with that, but that doesn't matter now. Go on to the next section of my video. So basically, like I said, I'm going to be talking about just how disheartening it is to read this book in 2023 because wherever I go, I just see the effects of whatever Wendell Berry said. Like I said, I consider this book as a prophecy because it's already predicted stuff that's transpiring right now. For example, you got famines, you got inequality, you got um, influencers, you know, manipulating people's lives, you got people being dependent on grocery businesses and stuff. And this was actually something strengthened by COVID, which is how Amazon, like companies like Amazon managed to grow during COVID. If COVID hadn't happened, maybe, you know, we wouldn't have this much of a problem with it, but that problem would have still remained, to be honest. And it's because of this that I feel that if we actually listen to people such as philosophers, such as Wendell Berry and philosophers in general, then maybe we could have actually managed to make a better world, which is why ancient philosophers such as Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, etc., all said that if philosophers were kings, then the world would have been a better place because they could actually comprehend ideas of government. And, you know, but as Niccolo Machiavelli once said, um, the ends justify the means. So if you're actually looking to do anything to just preserve the earth, it could actually work by using that logic. But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about preserving the environment. If it were population control, which is another grim thing about the current time, that the population grew exponentially because here's a fun fact if you're over 40 did you know that the human population doubled in your lifespan from 4 billion to 8 billion which is really amazing because back in 1972 when this book was published there were only 4 billion around 4 billion people in the world and look at us in 2023 we got 8 billion people so basically the world population the world demand for agriculture doubled in those 50 years and it's because of this that I honestly think that the world is going to end up having a lot of problems. So with that, I'd like to all encourage all of you to actually take part in preserving your local environment and, you know, contributing as much as you can to these sorts of causes and keeping your surroundings clean. Now, with that, I think I should end the video. Thank you for watching to the end. Be sure to like and subscribe.